And that locomotive is not only out front leading the cars behind, but that locomotive is the power source for the whole kit and caboodle, if you will. The locomotive supplies the power and those cars, as long as they stay attached, are following the locomotive. They are being led by the locomotive. They are relying on the power of the locomotive. So see, there are a lot of people who want to live the Christian life like NASCAR. Oh, I'm following the preacher. I went to move to town one time and a guy introduced me. Oh, I'm a, and I won't say that because you may recognize the name, but he called himself for the sake of illustration. He'd be like, hey, I'm a Pewite. <laughs> you would never want to be a Pewite. But he used the preacher's last name and said, I'm a Pewite. I said, what does that mean? So I father brother, I follow brother so-and-so. Don't follow me. It gets you in trouble. Don't follow the example of your grandma. Oh boy, she got a great prayer warrior. Bless her heart. And you don't follow the example of other people. You look to them, yes. But to be led by the Spirit means that the Holy Spirit is your power source. And as the Spirit leads, you follow Him. He empowers you. So being led by the Spirit, let's don't go NASCAR, let's go by rail, by locomotive, being led by the Spirit. Secondly, verse 16, but I say walk by the Spirit. What does this mean? To walk by the Spirit means that we are controlled by the Spirit. Very similar, being led by the Spirit, being controlled by the Spirit. Ephesians 5.18 says, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. There are two things every believer ought to understand. What does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? What does it mean to be controlled by the Spirit? To be filled with the Spirit is a daily, a daily experience. Yes, we receive the Holy Spirit at conversion, but the Holy Spirit controls our life. Well, let me just say, how does somebody control anything? You know, if, uh, you know, if we wanted to control a country, they'd have to surrender, wouldn't they? If we want to take control of a business, then they'd say, okay, we're, we're tired, we're out of here. We're 88 and out the gate, you take over. We want you to have control of our business. We want you to run our church. We want you to run our school. It's Holy Spirit, I want you to run my life. I'm gonna give you control. And so to be filled with the Spirit, to be controlled by the Spirit, is that we know that we have surrendered our life to the Holy Spirit. And that's a little bit of the how we're going to talk about in just a minute. But to be controlled by the Spirit, how can a person know if they're being controlled by the Spirit? This is very easy. This is very obvious. If you are filled with the Spirit, if you are controlled by the Spirit, everybody's going to know. You will know. Why? Because you will demonstrate or you will more accurately reflect the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's how you will know. Now, I don't know about you, but all those, those nine things, you know, I've been a Christian since 1975. And it was just a few weeks ago that I memorized the fruit of the Spirit. Can I encourage you to do that? Can I encourage you to memorize those nine things? Because those, the fruit of the Spirit, as I look at those, the fruit of the Spirit, those are the very things that Keith Pugh is not. Love, hey, I'm, you know, the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is what? Selfishness. I am selfish by nature. Joy. You know, there's a part of me that, you know, anyway, just go down the line. That's, that's not me, but the Holy Spirit in my life. Do you see what I'm talking about? And so I, I share that this morning with you to encourage you. Some of you think, well, you know, I'd love to be a spiritual giant. I'd love to grow in my faith. But if, if you can see the evidence of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, faithfulness and self-control, you can see that in your life. 
then you're being controlled by the Spirit because you bear the fruit of the Spirit. The work of the Spirit is what we need. It's an inter internal work of God. But let me say this. We are commanded to walk in the Spirit. Our will is involved. Just like Jesus said, I am the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. We have to stay attached to the locomotive. We have to abide in Christ. It is a daily decision. It's a daily act of the will. I'm going to walk in the Spirit as I rely on the Spirit. Again, it's that double-edged sword. It's that parallel truth we see all throughout Scripture. God's sovereignty, God's part, man's responsibility. God's not going to zap you out of bed in the morning, put your Bible in your lap and make you abide in Christ and memorize Scripture and read the Word and pray. But as you do those things, the Holy Spirit will begin to control your life and fill your life. Why is it important to walk by the Spirit? Y'all got to listen quicker, okay? We're running out of time. Why is it important to, listen, to walk by the Spirit? Verse 16 but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Now, when Paul talks about the flesh, nine times out of ten, he's talking about that inner desire for sin or selfishness, the flesh. There are occasions where Paul mentions the flesh as a bodily existence. Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, in this body, I live by faith. Philippians chapter 1, verse 22, he said, but if I am to live on in the flesh, it will mean fruitful labor for me. In other words, if I'm to continue in the body, then I'm going to continue to make an impact in the lives of other people. So most of the time when ta Paul talks about the flesh, he's talking about the sinful desire for self-righteousness or sinful pleasure. But now there are occasions where he's mentioning the body. So Paul says that the flesh, if we walk by the Spirit, we will not carry out the desires of the flesh. How do we handle that? Look at verse 24. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we're walking in the Spirit, we will not be controlled by the flesh. We will not be dominated by the flesh. But let me remind you this morning, as a believer, there is still a battle. There's still a battle. There's a war going on. Look at verse 17. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. You know what? I am so thankful for verse 17. Because that's where I am many times. I'm in a war. The flesh is the Spirit. Now, if I'm walking in the Spirit, living by the Spirit, the Spirit has control, I will not carry out the desires of the flesh. But can I be honest this morning? There are times when I'm not walking by the Spirit, but I'm in the flesh. Have you ever been there? You know, sometimes people, whenever they say, oh, I was, they really made a mistake, I was in the flesh. I was in the flesh. And most of the time when we think about being in the flesh, again, you know, we snapped at our spouse or we yelled at our, we kicked the cat. We, we were in the flesh. But let me tell you something. You can be in the flesh doing good. I'm going to be at the soup kitchen Saturday morning feeding those hungry people. Won't you come join me? You were as righteous as I am. You'd be down there on the west side of town feeding those hungry people. I'm in the flesh. I'm in the flesh. See, it's 
Life's tough, isn't it? Hard to figure it out sometimes. When you do the right thing, you're wrong. When you do the wrong thing, you're wrong <laughs> if you're in the flesh. We can do the right thing for the wrong reason and be what? Wrong. But there's a battle going on. The flesh sets its desire against the spirit. The spirit sets its desire against the flesh. It's like, you know, what's going, over on, going on over there in Iraq. Now we've thrown Saddam out. And we've established a new leadership. The nation of Iraq is different. But there's still a war going on in there. There are those insurgents. There's the resistance, little pockets here and there who will blow somebody up. They'll do stuff. I mean, they're serious. You know why? Because they don't like to be out of, out of the control center. They're angry because they're not in control anymore. That's the very sentiment of your flesh. It's angry because it's not in control anymore. So folks, you can expect a war. But let me tell you, there's one thing worse than being in the war. And that's whenever there's no war at all. You know what that means? The flesh is in control. The flesh is in control. When you're struggling and you're fighting that battle, you know what you ought to say? Praise God. God, give me the power to walk in the Spirit, but thank you, there's a battle going on. But when there's no battle, the flesh is in control. The only way we can fight that battle is by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Verse 18 gives us a second reason why we need to walk by the Spirit. If you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. The law, again, functions as an external constraint on our life or control in our life. The Spirit works from within. If you're walking in the Spirit, then you are free from the law. Now see, this goes back to what Paul told us in verse 13 and 14. Here's the law. The whole law is filled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's the law of God. Again, we can't do that on our own. They asked Jesus in Mark 12, 30, what's the first and greatest commandment? Jesus said the first and greatest commandment is like unto this. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Okay? Love God, love your neighbor.